this is the red line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. When it comes to this week's focus, there is one story I was told years ago by another journalist friend of mine that always sticks right in my mind. From his account, he met with an Emirati man outside a market in Dubai. It left him with this pretty grim assessment of the country. The Emirati man told him that his grandfather rode a camel through the desert. His father drove a BMW through the desert. He drove his Mercedes through the desert. His son will drive a Bugatti through the desert. But his son will ride a camel through the desert. The story hints at the unlikely tale that is the United Arab Emirates. Just 50 years ago, Dubai would be regarded as a small fishing village on the outskirts of the Gulf. That was until the UAE came across the huge quantities of oil and gas that lie just under the surface. These days, the UAE is a regional power, a center for trade and home to the world's tallest buildings, the world's nicest hotel, and the world's most lavish cars. And this money has bought them influence. They own bases throughout Africa and the Gulf. They pay for private militaries around the globe. They fight wars for influence in faraway countries. Oil wealth has made Abu Dhabi a force to be reckoned with. But what happens after the oil? How long can all of this last? Whilst the times are good, everyone seems to be doing fine. But the good times may not last forever. The world is slowly moving away from oil and gas. And that won't happen tomorrow. But the drums of progress will continue to beat. And oil won't be here forever. What will that mean for the nation of the United Arab Emirates though? Where Emiratis only make up 20% of the population living there. Where oil exports still make up the majority of the economy. What comes after this boom? Well to answer that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Black Gold When we talk about the UAE, we need to talk about the distinguished role of Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi is the most important emirate in the United Arab Emirates, which was established in 1971 by the British as part of its policy to pull out from east of the Suez. Thanks to its oil wealth and size, from the beginning, the Abu Dhabi controlled the United Arab Emirates. Uh, in the 1990s, right after the Gulf War, uh, to liberate Kuwait from the Iraqis, uh, Abu Dhabi decided to start uh, a new political line, an aggressive regional policy, build its military and become a regional power, and especially a maritime power. So for the past few years, uh, uh, the UAE, led by Abu Dhabi, has developed an aggressive uh, policy uh, to prevail in the uh, Middle East. And the UAE seems to have been su largely successful in achieving its uh, objectives. Hilal Kishan is a professor of political science at the American University in Beirut, specializing in the Gulf states. Hilal has written a number of great books on the region, and we are very pleased to have him back on the show today. As part of its mission, the UAE feels that the greatest threat to stability in the region and to its rise as a regional power is political Islam. Therefore, from the very beginning, they were keen on combating political Islam in Egypt, in Syria, and uh, in Turkey as well. The enmity between uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, Turkey has to go with what the Emiratis perceive as Erdogan's uh, policy to spread political Islam into the region. As the name the United Arab Emirates may suggest, this nation is a union of seven different size emirates, some being far more influential than others. Can you take us through this situation? The emirates that constituted the seven emirates used to be called the Omani Coast. Uh, in 1971, uh, the British allowed them to merge into a further federation. Uh, Abu Dhabi wanted to include Bahrain and Qatar in the United Arab Emirates, but Saudi Arabia opposed it. The, the Saudis did not want the UAE to become too powerful along the shores of the uh, Persian Gulf. Now, uh, five of the seven Emirates are too small and f largely poor. Uh, even Dubai, Dubai was uh, was a shanty town. I mean, the city of Dubai was a shanty town in, in the 60s. So thanks to 
you the Abu Dhabi's uh, oil riches. Uh, it was agreed in 1971 that the, that Abu Dhabi would lead the UAE in exchange for giving the other six Emirates financial aid. And since then, uh, Abu Dhabi has been uh, the virtual, I mean, not the virtual, the real uh, ruler and leader of the United Arab Emirates. So in theory, the UAE is made up of seven emirs that make collective decisions for the country. But in practice, it's only of the leaders of Abu Dhabi that make the decisions for the country. Why do the emirs of Dubai or Sharjah never make the calls for the UAE going forward? Every time Dubai encounters financial problems, Abu Dhabi comes to the rescue. When they had the major financial crash in 2008, Abu Dhabi gave Dubai billions of dollars to put it back on its feet. So when we talk about the UAE, we talk about Abu Dhabi. It is hardly a democracy, and they have no pretenses to being a democratic country. I mean, the form of government in uh, the UAE is... uh, Patrimonial. I mean, uh, it is a patrimonial, patrimonial political system, and the nature of politics is personal. So much like its bigger neighbor, Saudi Arabia, there is a president and leader of the country on paper, in this case, Khalifa bin Zayed. But in practice, it's his son, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, who is actually the most influential and has the most control over the direction of the country. Can you take us through this situation? Sure. Uh, I mean... Uh, the president of the UAE uh, is an ailing man, and uh, the uh, and uh, the crown prince is Mohammed bin Zayed. Mohammed bin Zayed is the strong man. He is the builder of the modern UAE with its uh, regional outlook. I mean, when I say regional outlook, uh, the plan to build uh, to transform. Uh, the UAE into what uh, you uh, what former U.S. Secretary of State called Little Sparta. Uh, uh, Abu, uh, the UAE emerged as a military force in uh, in the region. I think it's hard to understate the importance of the discovery of oil in the United Arab Emirates. Back in the early 70s, cities like Dubai would be regarded as small fishing villages by today's standards, whereas today it is home to the world's tallest building and a huge hub for regional business and tourism. Uh, can you take us through just how big the impact of the discovery of oil was for the UAE? The discovery of oil, uh, of course, uh, gave uh, the UAE, namely Abu Dhabi, most oil is in Abu Dhabi, the financial means to pursue the regional policies. And an important part of the regional policy became expansionism. Uh, as you know, Dubai if emerged to become a major uh, city that linked uh, between Uh, Europe and the the Far East, especially after uh, the British returned Hong Kong uh, to China. And so then uh, Dubai became uh, a major city that linked uh, the two continents. Uh, The UAE is interested in making sure that uh, Abu, that Dubai's port, uh, Jabal Ali, does not encounter any competition in the Middle East. And this explains uh, the UAE's policy of controlling uh, ports uh, a lot between uh, between the Persian Gulf and the Suez Canal to make sure that there will be no competition for Dubai's uh, port. Uh, and uh, an important uh, part of this policy was to control Aden because Aden has a natural port that could possibly compete uh, with uh, Dubai's uh, port. And this also explains... Uh, 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 Abu Dhabi's policy of controlling all uh, ports along the route leading to the Suez Canal and and the establishment of military bases all along to transform the UAE into a maritime power to preserve, to to, to protect its naval operations. But Dubai is trying to diversify away from oil at the moment, knowing it won't be the backbone of the world economy forever. How are they trying to achieve this? Dubai is interested, uh, uh, especially since the days of Mohammed bin Rashid, interested in uh, creating a multi-sectoral economy uh, with emphasis on uh, tourism, uh, Jabal Ali's port. uh, uh, Dubai became a center for for the distribution of uh, manufactured goods throughout uh, the region. Uh, And also... uh, Dubai relies on air transport. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Dubai especially has important uh, 
uh, uh, the, the Emirates. The Emirates is an in, um, important international carrier. So they depend on services, tourism, uh, transportation, and uh, also uh, uh, shipping. But uh, for the most part, uh, 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 Dubai's economic di diversification is fragile and uh, tenuous. Most of their banking operations uh, uh, depend, I would say, on, uh, on money laundering and the, the trafficking of uh, narcotics, especially from Afghanistan to the West. Many of their operations that made uh, Dubai a prominent uh, regional city, uh, many of the, of, I mean, of the foundations of their economy are of a dubious quality. When the Arab Spring ripped through the Middle Eastern world, many of the long-standing monarchies and dictatorships either fell or had to implement major reforms to keep themselves in place. The UAE, though, virtually escaped untouched. How did they manage this? Well, from the very beginning, the UAE did not promote uh, the rise of civil society. They didn't allow for the rise of uh, NGOs. They didn't allow for the rise of the labor union. And the fact that more than 90% of the population is expatriated, and that uh, presented a, a barrier between them and the outsiders. So whenever there is an opposition or disgruntlement about the situation, there was a displacement of anger uh, uh, that shielded the government. People expressed their anger and frustration at the expatriate community, at the expatriate community. And the government, aware of uh, the needs of the population, uh, has uh, indulged the, the local population, the indigenous population, and uh, provided for them a very high uh, 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 level of income. So if you take the countries of the Arab uh, uprising, the most, one of the most important, uh, f I mean, uh, uh, demands by the protest movements was uh, the improvement of the economy. And this is a situation that the UAE did not have to go through. So uh, every time there would be a signs of unrest in the country, the, the government would indulge the population and in services and providing them with financial uh, 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 dividends that more often than not even exceeded their expectations. On quite a number of issues, the UAE works very closely with its neighbours in Saudi Arabia. How would you summarise the relationship between Riyadh and Abu Dhabi? Is it a big brother-little brother relationship, or is it something far more complicated than that? Uh, they, again, they hate each other. The Saudi Arabia was opposed to the establishment of the UAE, and when the UAE wanted to, when Abu Dhabi wanted to include Bahrain and Qatar in it, Saudi Arabia opposed it. And when in 1974 uh, Abu Dhabi wanted to create a causeway to connect it to Bahrain, the Saudis, the uh, the Saudis uh, vetoed the, the plan, and uh, in fact, uh, the Saudis. Uh, took over a chunk of land that belonged to the UAE that would have connected uh, uh, Abu Dhabi to, uh, to Qatar. And this is still a contested area. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Emiratis demand uh, uh, access and the sovereignty over, uh, over that stretch of land, 40 kilometer stretch of land that would connect them to, uh, to, uh, to Qatar. A few years ago, the Saudis uh, closed the uh, uh, their uh, their border with uh, uh, with the UAE, creating traffic jam and uh, shortages. Uh, so uh, th there is there there is uh, uh, bitter relations between the two countries. In 1974, the Saudis coerced the UAE to sign the Jeddah Agreement, uh, uh, by which the UAE uh, recognized the Saudi control over over that stretch of land then that they later revoked. So uh, now uh, the UA Saudi Arabia does not want uh, the UAE to become a dominant power in the Gulf. Saudi Arabia has traditionally viewed itself as the big sister in the Gulf. But it seems that they are losing control over the UAE that uh, has gone outside the uh, political and military control of Saudi Arabia. With that in mind, what do you see for the future of the United Arab Emirates? 
Well, the UAE is playing a big game, you know. This is a country that does not have a local population. You cannot become a major regional power if you depend exclusively on expatriates or mercenaries. So I I think there are limits to the ability of uh, the uh, Emirates to project itself as a regional power. The only reason why uh, the UAE seems to be a growing uh, military and political power is because of the situation of unrest in the Arab region. If the Arab countries were to stabilize, if Egypt were to restore its historical role in the region, uh, had Iraq not been uh, evicted from the regional equation, then you, the UAE wouldn't have had a chance to present itself as a major power. I think in the long term of events, you know, when the region... Uh, assumes a new direction. I don't think when it when it stabilizes because it will never stabilize. But should developments in the region move in a direction where that would allow for the rise of region, other regional powers, I think the role of the UAE will diminish as a natural uh, consequence. Saudi Arabia and the UAE may have a lot of points of contention between them domestically, but for quite a number of the international goals, things match up very well. They are both dependent on oil revenues. They both look to the US for freedom of transport in the seas. They both detest Iran. And they both have complicated relationships with Turkey. But the point they seem to be working really, really closely together on is the Saudi war in Yemen. For a number of years now, the Emiratis have been deeply involved in the conflict here, both with Emirati military support, financial support of the forces here, and supplying private militaries to fight in the conflict in the south of the country. So why does Yemen matter so much to the UAE? Why would they be spending so much blood and treasure on a war that, unlike the Saudis, is nowhere near their borders? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. A Borrowed War I think it's a really interesting question, because if you just look back very briefly at the past, you know, it was an insignificant place at the end of the Arabian Peninsula, with hardly any people living off fisheries and uh, piracy, kind of, um, and basically had was of no interest to anyone except the Brits who wanted to stop it, stop it pirating and closing their route to India. So, and now we're suddenly talking about a country that really, you know, sees itself as a medium ranking power in the world and that has, you know, a lot of influence that is active internationally, not just in its immediate region, but as far as Northwest Africa. Um, And so it's really, you know, it, it is a very important question to look at. And I think one thing to remember is that, you know, now the UAE has 10 million population, but of these a mere, at best, 2 million are nationals. The rest are migrant laborers with, uh, of all levels, I mean, migrant laborers from incredibly senior guys like your very own Mike Hindmarsh, who runs the presidential guard, to, you know, the South Asian indentured laborers who are building everything in the place. So it's, uh, you know, it's really... It has really in the last, I'd say in the last five five years, or more widely the last 10 years, but really the last five years, turned itself and it believes itself to be a really important power. And I think that's largely because of its leader, Mohammed bin Zayed. I mean, he's the officially the crown prince, but I mean, he's the actual leader because the, the actual leader is basically physical medically unfit to rule. So we're talking about a place that really has suddenly emerged um, as an important state, temporarily at least. Helen Lackner is a British writer and academic well known for her work on the Middle East and Yemen. She's a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and a researcher for the SOAS University in London. She's also the author of the amazing book, Yemen in Crisis, we are very pleased to have her back on the show today. But basically, without this, its enormous wealth and power, it would still be this insignificant little place at the, you know, in the corner of the Arabian Peninsula. It's this financial clout that has enabled it 
to do, you know, all the things that it is doing. And it's probably worth very quickly remembering that it's formed of seven more or less independent sheikhdoms of whom, you know, two or three are really poor uh, and only two have any significant wealth. And the two are Abu Dhabi that has basically all the money and Dubai that has all the other things, i.e. the tourism, you know, the the other the other economic activities because it also hasn't got very much oil so basically without the oil money you know the uae would be a place that no one's heard of basically the uae are large supporters of the u.s actions in the middle east supporting the u.s directly in almost all of its anti-terror operations why is abu dhabi so friendly with washington what are they hoping to gain from that relationship I think the, you know, for the US, the UAE was just an appendage of Saudi Arabia. And again, it is the oil and the oil companies that involved the the US. It was also part of the whole overall scheme in the region of the US ousting the British influence, because although there's still a lot of Brits around in the UAE and in important positions, uh, politically, I think the, the US has basically taken over and got far more influence. And I think the fact that the UAE has been happy to send its soldiers and to develop this military capacity, including being active in Afghanistan and, you know, let alone everything else we're talking about in the peninsula, you know, are assets as far as the as far as the US is concerned. Uh, but again, if you notice, you know, the main US bases in the region are in Bahrain and in Qatar not in the UAE. So that's, you know, maybe also worth thinking about. Well, since you mentioned Saudi Arabia there, how would you describe the relationship between Riyadh and Abu Dhabi? I think it's a very interesting relationship. Um, And I think it's developing in a specific direction, which I have been saying it's been developing for some time. And and, and now a lot of other people are beginning to agree with me. I mean, the big brother, little brother, you know, MBZ to MBS bit was, I think, quite true when uh, basically Salman and MBS came to power in 2015 in, in Saudi. Uh, and it has carried on to some extent uh, over the last five, six years. It is very definitely changing at the moment uh, for two reasons, I think, fundamentally. One, because, you know, MBS, i.e. Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia and the de facto ruler, as people say, you know, is no longer um, the kind of junior who does what he's told. Uh, number two, the um, I mean, I think the Emirati's policy was you know, we're still quite a small place and these guys next door are really big. And if it comes to it, you know, we're going to be in trouble. So a lot of their policy has been to basically neutralize the long-term risks of Saudi, that Saudi Arabia could present to them. And I think, you know, an, a big, an important element about that has been um Initially, that relationship between MBZ and MBS, what has happened in the last few years and is gradually becoming much more noticeable and much broader is an increasing set of tensions between them and an increasing rivalry between them. Now, it is most obvious in what's happening in Yemen, but it's also true in other aspects. But if you look at the internal policies, You know, for example, what's happened in the last few months is that the Saudis have said that all major companies operating in Saudi Arabia should move their headquarters to Riyadh. Now, this basically means moving out of Dubai because most of these outfits are in Dubai. Um, And you're having, you know, with the economic crisis and the worsening of an economic crisis, and indeed an economic crisis which is much more significant for the Saudis than it is for the Emiratis. So you have, you know, you're having more and more problems building up between them. And I think, you know, and you also, if you look back into history in the 50s, they had serious problems between them. So you've had this phase where everything was reasonably well. But again, even if you look at how the GCC has evolved in the last, you know, decades, 
you can see a number of situations where there have been clear disagreements between the Saudis and the Emiratis and, and the others. It also brings up the other points you were asking about, you know, the question of what, what are the Emiratis doing all around the peninsula. To me, their policy of running and being in charge of ports and taking a whole series of ports around the peninsula and, you know, is part of their protection against the day when they have serious problems with the Saudis. Well, this brings us to the major crisis currently underway in the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen. Now, if you want to check out the history of Yemen uh, and find out what each of the sign's war goals are in here, you can check out our piece we did on the country a little while ago. It was episode four. Otherwise, if you don't want to check that out, to vastly oversimplify, Yemen is in the middle of a brutal three-way civil war between the Iranian-backed Houthis in the northwest of the country, the Saudi and UAE-backed government forces in the north and middle of the country, and al-Qaeda and ISIS throughout the south and center of the nation. So this current war began in 2015, when Saudi Arabia invaded Yemen to try and crush the Houthi uprising in 2015. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman claiming the war would be over in three days at the time. The war, though, is still dragging on, and the Saudis and Emiratis have thrown so much men and money at this situation. I understand why Saudi Arabia is desperate to not have an Iranian-backed nation on its southern border, but why is the UAE so involved? Yemen is quite far from the UAE's main population centers, so why are they throwing so much blood and treasure at this war? Yeah, I mean, the Saudis do share a border and have had this perception of Yemen as a threat for decades. Um, I find this somewhat irrational, but, you know, there it is. So you have, um, you know, the, the Saudis consider Yemen as their backyard, which it is, and they don't want a regime there that they don't like. And neither the Saudis nor the Emiratis like a republic. Remember, Yemen is the only republic in the peninsula. It's nowhere near a perfect republic, but it is not a a, a sort of inherited monarchy. And I think that's an element that is of concern to the Saudis and the Emiratis. The Emiratis, I think, got in initially partly out of this the strategy of controlling ports and as much as they can of their long-term maritime strategy. And because at that time, you know, they, they got on great and the, and the Saudis wanted them in and, and they were, you know, they and the Saudis are the only two states of the coalition that make any decisions. I don't think the Senegalese have made a single decision if they ever even turned up. Uh, let alone the other members of the coalition who didn't bother turning up at all or refused to turn up like the Pakistanis. And we can leave the Sudanese aside, you know, if we need to talk about them. So, you know, the, the Emiratis also, I think they had the idea that they can treat South Yemen like the Emirates. If you look, again, if you look back into history, you know, what did the Brits try and do in, in, in Aden and the Protectorates was to create a federation, which, faith abysmally, it never happened, really. Well, it happened on paper for three years. Uh, and then five years later, they went and created the same thing in the Emirates. And the big difference is the one in the Emirates worked and is thriving. So, you know, one wonders to what extent the Emiratis were thinking that they can reproduce this situation. They also, you know, were concerned in Yemen, all of Yemen, with one of their major obsessions with, you know, in world politics, which is what you can call political Islam. I mean, Muslim Brothers or any other form of political Islam, which MBZ considers to be, you know, completely beyond the pale and and his deathly enemy. And so, you know, while maybe for the Saudis fighting the Houthis was the primary consideration, for the Emiratis, the concern at the presence and existence and rise of a Muslim brother type organization, which is the Islam party, which is only partly Muslim brother type. But I think for the Emiratis, all you need is one Muslim brother in the place and you consider the whole outfit to be, you know, a major problem. So I think that, you know, they, they went in to help out with the Saudis. They went in to control the political situation in the region, but very quickly their tactics started deferring. So after 2018, the UAE became tired of losing its own men and started changing to using private military contractors to fight their war in Yemen. 
predominantly Sudanese and Chadian soldiers. How did this change affect the battlefield when Yemen switched to using predominantly private military contractors? Basically, until the Stockholm Agreement, the policy was the coalition takes her data and the Houthis will have to give in. Once they were not able to take her data because of the Stockholm Agreement, the UAE decided that, you know, this is just a dead loss. Let's move on. And so they withdrew part, they withdrew the majority of their own physical troops. Now, that happened partly because of a bombing that took place in September 2016 in Mareg, where all 50 of their national troops were killed. But also, you know, as a, as a general strategy, after 2018, they withdrew basically initially to, to, to just to the Tihama coast. And then they said they were leaving in June 2019. And at that point, they withdrew most of their people, except for three or four specific uh, locations, which they consider strategic. And they include on the south southern coast, Balhaf, the gas exporting uh, port, and a big base in, um, in Chabwa in the interior, which is basically there to, to try and protect their... Proxies. I don't like using the word proxies, but I think in this case it's almost correct of the Southern Separatist Southern Transitional Council, who are trying to be more powerful, you know, further east in the Southern Governorates, whereas basically their only base is very, very small and very much around Aden. But the 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 agents or the people who are the most, the closest to the United Arab Emirates are the Southern Transitional Council, who are fundamentally in disagreement with the officially internationally recognized government of President Hadi, which itself is largely supported by the Saudis. So that's enough, that's where the, the, the clash between the Saudis and the Emiratis is most tense and most important in Yemen. So an island that is getting a lot of attention at the moment in this war is the island of Socotra, which is part of Yemen. It's about 350 kilometers to the southeast of the Yemeni coast and is at the mouth of the Gulf of Aden. This island has been tussled over many times, and the UAE is currently throwing their weight behind one of the rebel groups, a group of rebels that aren't big fans of the official government backed by the Saudis or by the Houthis backed by Iran. Why is Socotra so important to the UAE here? Now, Socotra is at quite a distance from the mainland. And again, if you have a map, you'll see it's much nearer to Somalia than it is actually to Yemen. It's an isolated island, which is a fantastic, has fantastic um, physical characteristics and, you know, is a major conservation area and should be, you know, saved as that. And this population is, again, slightly... Um, different from most of the other parts of Yemen. So the importance of Socotra, I think, is because the, for the Emiratis, they see it as a, a sort of a stepping stone on their, on their surrounding the Arabian Peninsula operation. And they have basically, they've basically taken it over. I mean, it is a- absolutely shocking, but that's what has happened. You know, nowadays, there are tourists, there are Israeli tourists going to Socotra, you know, vi- with permits from the UAE and on flights from the UAE. I mean, this is just, you know, beyond belief, really, but it's happening. Um, the latest I heard is that some of the Socotra people are being started to complaining because these people are walking around in, you know, what as far as they're concerned is underwear. Um, certainly not what you call culturally sensitive um, apparel. So the importance of Socotra, I think, is really as a position uh, to to a, a kind of position on on this route. And nowadays, Socotra is basically under the control of the Emiratis and the SPC. Um, And there have been quite a few clashes there in the last two or three years because the Saudis did try and maintain a position. The official government tried to maintain a position, but they were eventually ousted by the SPC. And as I just said, the Emiratis are running direct flights there. Um, they're, they're basically controlling all in and out movements into the place. 
So Cultura seems to be a small part and overall much larger strategy by the UAE to turn the Red Sea into some sort of Emirati canal. The UAE has bases and ports all along the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea in countries like Somalia, Somaliland, Yemen, Eritrea and Sudan. What are the Emiratis trying to achieve by positioning themselves all around the Red Sea choke points? I think the goal is to have, you know, one, to control ports because they have, you know, Dubai ports world uh, who try and be a major economic operation worldwide. Um, And basically this gives them control of the Red Sea and access to the Suez Canal. And, you know, now we go go beyond to Libya and elsewhere. So I think that to me, the, the, the fundamental objective of this is to have them a, sec- a sort of security blanket for when the, the situation with the Saudis deteriorates. Because if they control all these places, they will be able to basically control the exit for from Saudi Arabia of oil and other goods. Because if they control the Red Sea and the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula, even if the Saudis manage to build their pipeline in Mahra and do these other things that they want to do, you know, the Emiratis will be in a strong position to to control them. And I think on this, it's worth pointing out two things. One is they have apparently evacuated the base in Eritrea in the last few months. But what they have done and they've just finished doing is building a full scale landing strip on Perim Island, which is also known in Yemen as uh, Mayun. So you can see both names. And that is the island that basically blocks the Bab al-Mandab. It's in the middle of the Bab al-Mandab. So if you are there, you basically have control of the Bab al-Mandab, which means eventually you have control of the of the Red Sea. Uh, sorry, of, yeah, of the Red Sea, but mainly of the Suez Canal. But the Saudis are the only ones the UAE are fighting with. Currently, as it stands, UAE-backed forces are fighting Turkish-backed forces in both Libya and southern Somalia. Why would the Emiratis be engaging in proxy fights with Turkey in countries so far from their own territory? I think the, the Libya thing is really them punching above their weight. We want to make show ourselves as being a, a, a world power, a power of, of international importance beyond our home, you know, beyond our backyard. We are powerful. We are important. Why have they sent a, a, a launch to miss, uh, not a missile, a, a satellite heading for, where is it going? Mars, I think. You know, why, why are they doing all, all this kind of thing? It's really trying to place themselves as a major world power. Around 80% of the UAE's population are not Emiratis, but mostly foreign labourers working inside the UAE. Does this worry Abu Dhabi that on average their citizens are outnumbered four to one by foreign nationals inside the UAE? You know, in a place like uh, like Dubai, it's more than 90%. And in Abu Dhabi, it's about 70%. So it's much, I mean, yes, it's it's they feel extremely ambiguous about this. Nationals tend to feel, you know, we're not at home. We can't we can't do things the way we want to do them. We're not feeling comfortable on a day-to-day basis. So there's definitely that level of discomfort. For the state itself, you know, having a bigger population is an asset. And, you know, the place would basically fall apart tomorrow without the without the migrant labor. I mean, you know, we, you'd be left with, you know, 20% of the you'd be left with two million people there. With the direction things are going in the Gulf at the moment, do you think the UAE will take the top spot as the big player in the Gulf, or will Saudi Arabia continue to hold on to that spot for the next few years? I think the UAE are not going to take over from Saudi. I think they might want to. Um, I think they're not making quite as many you know, obvious blunders as MBS has made, but MBS is reducing his number of blunders as he gets older. And um, I think the overstretching and the overambition of the UAE is likely to lead them to make a few major mistakes. I think Libya was one of them, and they are kind of, I think, being forced out of that one. Um, I think they will continue their feud with Qatar and Qatar, although it's much smaller, has financially got a lot more possible and is being, I think, much wiser in its approach. 
And ultimately, I think, you know, the issue of Iran will also play. But again, you know, the UAE have a much more ambiguous attitude about Iran. I mean, they know that they're not they're not far from Iran if any missiles are uh, And, you know, the Dubai economy has been dependent on Iran for decades, um, as much as on any other trade. So these are all elements, I think, which will continue. I, I would suspect, and, you know, if I'm wrong, we can come back on this, that it's probably reaching its peak and is not going to get more more important in the world. If it will at best stay where it is or probably gradually diminish. The UAE is looking to assert itself as a major power to take this pivotal moment in history where oil, the thing they have a lot of, is the main energy source. They need to take this once in a millennia opportunity and make the most out of it. But when you only have the, let's say, 70 years to set your nation up for the following 300, every decision you make is crucial. Whether it's securing your footholds in the Red Sea, trying your best to stifle religious-led governments like we see in Turkey, or to try and use this opportunity to knock out your long-term enemies in places like Qatar. How successful will the UAE be, though? What are their long-term plans here? What are they going to do with this one-time offer? And will it be beneficial for Abu Dhabi to go alone or join up with major powers? Well, to answer all of that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Dividing the Red Sea Well, let's just start off by saying the UAE is really tiny uh, at the end of the day. I know that it punches above its weight, but you know, compared to countries like Egypt or Saudi Arabia, it's tiny, but it really is a regional powerhouse. Uh, it's got some characteristics that are just unique, frankly, and assets that are unmatched. I think it's the only country in the Arab world that can effectively project power, I would say, far beyond its borders. And we've seen that um, not just in Yemen, but also in Afghanistan and Libya and Somalia and many other places. And I suspect you can ask me about those later on. Uh, it's got a leadership that's pretty visionary and incredibly ambitious. Um, it's wealth. It's quite immense, although much of it is based on oil revenues, I understand. Uh, but more important than wealth, you've got a leadership that knows exactly how to utilize those resources. So this just gets us into the uh, governance aspect of it. So they're far more effective at utilizing the resources and leveraging the resources than any other neighbor, including the bigger and wealthier even Saudis. So in short, uh, I think it's remarkable that in such a short period of time, let's just say perhaps a couple of decades, right? The UAE is now considered by many in the region as a model, a model for governance, a model for tolerance, cultural, religious, a model for coexistence, but let's just be very clear, certainly not a model for democracy. But guess what? The UAE is just fine with it. Bilal Saab is a political military analyst specializing in the Middle East and U.S. regional foreign policy for the Middle East Institute. He's also the former senior advisor for security cooperation in the Pentagon's office of the Undersecretary for Defense Policy and had oversight of the U.S. Central Command in the region. Bilal is also the author of Rebuilding Arab Defense, America's quest for military partnership in the Middle East. We are very pleased to have him join us today. The operative word is, and has always been, diversification. And the multitude of renewable energy projects, the international investments that they make, the remarkable innovation displayed by Abu Dhabi, and to a certain extent Dubai, that this is all suggesting that the UAE is doing better than the rest of the oil producing nations in the GCC. But, and it's a big but, of course, to really reduce their reliance on oil, I mean, they know they have to transform their economies, uh, perhaps introduce a range of taxes, uh, remove longstanding full subsidies, just stuff they've never done before. And you can imagine that this process will carry some political implications. Um, you know, as a side note, I was talking about renewable energy projects. You know, you got to remember that the UAE also has uh, some of the world's least 
carbon intensive oil. So they've got some pretty interesting oil uh, resources there. And they are in a position to leverage this uh, resource of hydrogen. So I think the country roughly produces 300,000 tons of hydrogen a year. So what they're going to do, I think, over the next few years and decades is just try to look at markets in Asia and Europe to sell it. But that's just more of a long-term play, of course. The UAE has large amounts of money and a very stable domestic political situation. So why is it so important for them to be adventuring abroad in search of enemies? Why are they so invested in international intervention throughout the region? The man running the country is Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, so one of the sons of Zayed. And he is truly a, a visionary kind of leader. He's not the kind of guy who's going to be sitting at the beach and sipping a pina colada. No, he really wants to project power. He wants to turn the country into, as I mentioned before, a regional powerhouse. Uh, certainly ambitions beyond the borders of the country. Uh, and... A lot of it really has been made possible by the fact that the traditional powers that have had influence in the region have, uh, you know, their fortunes have sort of dissipated, whether it's the Egyptians, whether it's um, the Saudis. So they just saw an opportunity. They seized it. Uh, They weathered the Arab Spring of 2011, right, quite well. Um, And so... All of these factors, their own internal ambition, the troubles of others um, made it possible for the UAE to really project power in ways like no other country in the region has done before and quite effectively. Well, of all the conflicts the UAE is involved in at the moment, let's talk about the big one first. What are Abu Dhabi's goals inside this Yemen war? What are they hoping to achieve here? So uh, I mentioned already to you the power projection uh, side of things. So they saw that as an ideal, I don't want to call it lab, but just an ideal location to project power, especially against uh, an opponent, uh, of course, in the war in Yemen, that is relatively inferior, even though they do have missiles um, and uh, UAVs that they've received from the Iranians. But at the end of the day, this is a counterinsurgency campaign. And so the balance of power tilted quite heavily in favor of uh, the UAE and, of course, the forces that they've supported inside Yemen. So power projection, one of them, uh, protecting some key economic interests in that region. Uh, The UAE, as you know, also has some kind of an allergy and obsession with political Islamists wherever they operate. Just like we in the West had that against the communists, uh, the UAE has that against political Islamists. They see them as maximalist, sort of uncompromising, um, ideological bunch, and wherever they are, they're going to go after them. And they do have some kind of a presence in uh, Yemen, uh, represented by the Islah uh, party. Uh, and so that was one of the aims of why they wanted to go to Yemen to try to counter their influence. And then, of course, another nefarious actor that they very much worry about is Iran. And Iran had a stake in the conflict. They supported the Houthis. And so by going after the Houthis, the UAE was hoping that they could try to dent the influence of the Iranians and uh, prevent them from turning Yemen into uh, another backyard, the backyard of theirs. Uh, Obviously, it was the same motivation that the Saudis to go into Yemen. And then finally, and this is no small detail, they want to show off their counterterrorism credentials to the senior partner, which is us, the United States, by going after the one organization that we really uh, are most worried about, at least in terms of its international uh, reach and its capabilities. And that's uh, what we call AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And they did a pretty good job at that. And so uh, a host of reasons, also motivations, Michael, whether it's their economic, military, or uh, security. Um, And I think they've achieved quite a good number of those objectives, even though they have now, as you know, uh, withdrawn. But they've kept a lasting influence there through their surrogates, through their proxies, through their partners. And they're now able to protect shipping routes in the Gulf of Aden and elsewhere around Yemen. So all in all, once again, despite the military withdrawal, I think the UAE has really checked the box on a number of strategic uh, objectives there. The UAE has invested bucket loads of money into a string of ports all around the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, both in the small choke point areas as well as in the wider peripheries. 
But why put this much effort into the Red Sea? What is the long-term goal for the UAE here? So once again, they see an opportunity and uh, they want to seize it. Uh, I think that Africa and the Red Sea, uh, that region, there's just a ton of geopolitics there for a good reason, because there's just a lot of economic opportunity there. And the UAE has made it very clear that they want to be a player there. So that's why you see them sort of operating like the Chinese. They have the what do the Chinese have? One belt, one road. So the UAE has the same sort of exact situation with the commercial footprint in Somaliland and all the other places that you just mentioned. Uh, they do actually have a strategy, believe it or not, for the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea. And a lot of it is based, of course, on what DP World, which is the logistics and um, the port operator company that's owned mostly by the Dubai government. And I think it operates nearly like 80 marine and inland terminals around the world. So they're pretty large and effective organization. I had a chance to visit it not too long ago. Um, and those guys are pretty active in that area, creating a belt of influence, constructing ports, as you said yourself, gaining access to ports, and sort of like doing the economic diplo diplomacy for the UAE. Um, so it's just a gradual consolidation and a sphere of influence around the Bab, Bab and Mandab Strait, as you very well know. It's true that they've dismantled uh, their uh, base in uh, Djibouti, um, uh, or in Eritrea, I should say, but they have redeployed some forces to, I would say, the quieter and more strategic uh, Mayun Island in southern uh, Yemen. They're now establishing some kind of a triangle of influence in Aden and Yemen, uh, in Mayun Island in the south, uh, but also in the strategic island of Socotra, as you said yourself, which lies in the middle of the Bab el Strait, uh, which is a major oil trading channel. So quite ambitious, but as you can imagine, Michael, this is an area that, well, not unlike any other, has a ton of local politics. So it's not easy to navigate all those politics, not easy to navigate rivalries with the Turks or the Chinese, with many others who are interested in, in that area. Uh, I would even also mention the French, uh, the Qataris. So it's geopolitics and fierce rivalries playing out among not only Gulf Arab nations, but also the Turks, the French, the Chinese. And we also have a you know, a role to play in there. We as the United States, uh, um, and we just dispatched one of our own special envoys, uh, Jeff Feltman, to try to organize our assets there and try to preserve our interests there. So I'm not shocked why the UAE is there. They have the ability. Why not? There's a lot of economic opportunity there. Whether it's Libya or Somalia or Yemen, one thing these UAE conflicts all have in common is that the UAE doesn't send its own soldiers to fight. They instead quite often hire African mercenaries. And in many of the documented cases, these mercenaries are people hired from places like Sudan or Chad. They're quite often trained and told that they'll be off to guard jewelry stores in Dubai and sit around under air conditioning. Before, halfway through the training, they're taught how to fire heavy machine guns and then shipped off to places like Yemen. Why is the UAE so keen on this hired gun strategy rather than using its own forces in the conflicts? Well, for a simple reason. I mean, it's always far more efficient to fight with other people's, you know, troops. Uh, it reduces costs. And, you know, depending on how you train them and equip them, of course, you can achieve military objectives as effectively, if not more effectively, than deploying your own troops, at least in large numbers. And reality is that the UAE is actually pretty good at that as far as training and equipping. And we've seen that success uh, on, in this, on display in, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Libya. Uh, you know, we as the United States, we call the strategy by, with, and through. And that's what CENTCOM does. And I think that's the future moving forward, especially in contexts that are more like counterinsurgency environments. Uh, and that's what the UAE wants to do. I mean, they're a tiny country. They're a tiny military. There's no way that they can afford going in heavy with large numbers and all that. So what they're going to do is just sort of like lead from behind, provide the assets, intervene where they have to in terms of conventional power, as you saw in Mukalla and in Aden. But the real fighting, the trenches, the, you know, from one street and neighborhood to another, they'll probably leave that, and they have, to, you know, local proxy forces and frankly, that's a smart way, smart way to do it. In 2017, after a visit to the region from the new president, Donald Trump, the UAE and Saudi Arabia unleashed a blockade upon their neighbor, Qatar, hoping to economically break the small nation 
and forced them to cease all of their soft power operations throughout the region. The blockade though was a dismal failure, and a few years later Saudi Arabia and the UAE gave up on it. So why did the UAE and Saudi Arabia push for this in the first place? And why did the blockade end up failing? Because we care about Qatar. Uh, I don't understand how they missed the tiny uh, detail that we have forward uh, uh, headquarters of CENTCOM uh, based in Qatar. Uh, and the country is quite critical for us as far as military operations across the region. Um, so that was one tiny detail that they either omitted or ignored or dismissed. I'm not sure what it was. So we were not on board with what they were doing. And they realized that from day one, but as it became much clearer and the costs kept generating and somehow also the Qataris were quite resilient and innovative in resisting this campaign, it made it obvious to them that this was not going to uh, play out positively for them in the long term. The Qataris diversified their bilateral relations. They got closer to the Turks. They got different kinds of supplies uh, and supply routes that they established. Uh, they even got closer to the Iranians, which was one of them, ironically, one of the motivations of the Iranians and the Saudis in the beginning is that the Qataris were getting cozy with the Iranians, so they needed to be punished. But then as a result of their punishment, uh, the Qataris did exactly what the Emiratis and the Saudis were hoping they wouldn't do. So they got closer to the Iranians, but that has different motivations as well, because they share a natural gas um uh, field with them. So there's geography there, and there's also economic interest that is in common with the Iranians. Uh, so Qatari inno innovative tactics in terms of resistance, uh, resilience and sustainability, and they surely do have deep pockets. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. So that, that was certainly useful for them. And the fact that we were not on board with anything the UAE and the Saudis were doing just made it clear that this was not going to be a successful uh, operation. Uh, and it generated quite an hefty political costs in Washington. So if you ask me if they achieved anything, not a whole lot, because we're back to, you know, sort of normal relations, at least now between the Saudis and the, uh, and the Qataris. Uh, the UAE and Qatar need a little bit more time because I believe that the rivalry there is a little bit more intense than it is between the Qataris and the Saudis. And it's just old fashioned, stupid rivalry stuff instead of, cooperation it's based much more on competition uh but there's also a difference in views uh, same as difference of views between the ue and turkey uh qatar is sort of much more sympathetic to the plight of political islamists in the region obviously in the ways that the ue is not so there's that there's the rivalry and the reputation of who's the ace in in the gulf so a lot of that is going to take some time really to sort of mellow, but um, I, I, I think that no matter what happens, politically speaking, in terms of reconciliation and all that, there's always going to be that something between Abu Dhabi and Doha that is going to cause some tensions, some some awkwardness uh, in relations in ways like, I don't think the Saudis really are as apprehensive about the Qataris as they were. This was sort of driven right from the start by the UAE, quite frankly, and the Saudis tagged along uh, and then they realized that this just is becoming too costly and frankly, it's uh, getting out of hand, out of control. Obviously, right now we're seeing this Middle Eastern Cold War of sorts taking place between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But where does the UAE fit into that? Yeah, that's a good question, Michael. And I think that uh, there's a sufficient degree of pragmatism in UAE perspectives towards Iran. Of course, let's not kid ourselves. They obviously see the Iranians as expansionists in the region. They don't agree with uh, the way they run things, the way they pursue uh, their interests, their ideology, which they obviously see as radical. So the UAE leadership has never minced words about what the uh, major threats to the region are, and that's uh, extremism, whether it's Sunni or Shiite, doesn't matter. That is always going to be there, but they also realize that geography and economic interests plays a huge role in how they approach the Iranians. There's a lot of trade going on, as you no, Michael, between Dubai, the Emirates, uh, the smaller glitzy Emirates, or the economic hub, at least it used to be, uh, and the Iranians. So they want to preserve that. And so the Iranians also have a presence there. So they don't want to, I say, provoke the Iranians too much. 
Uh, that's why they're super careful about how they treat their newfound relationship with the Israelis, right? So they don't want it to cause tensions with the Iranians. And the UAE is very, very aware that it is quite vulnerable when it comes to, um, you know, the uh, being in, in range of the missiles of the Iranians. We talked a bit about the UAE's investment in its own Belt and Road through Africa. But what about the main Belt and Road? Has China invested much into the United Arab Emirates? No, it's invested, and I think not just in the UAE, but in the uh, Middle East overall. As you very well know, the Chinese rely quite a bit on uh, Middle Eastern oil uh, to sustain their economy. Uh, there's some level of economic cooperation and trade going on between the two, but also military, uh, uh, interesting military relationship. I think the UAE buys quite a bit of drones from the Chinese and other uh, technology that would be um that would serve some requirements of the UAE armed forces. Um, but I would say it's still in its embryonic stage. I don't think it has risen to the level of calling it a strategic relationship. It is still primarily transactional, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. I think the Chinese also see that as well. Um, but this is really, I think the evolution of the bilateral relationship will always depend on what happens between Abu Dhabi and Washington. Uh, the greater the concerns of the UAE towards Washington, uh, the more likely that they would really, uh, I'm going to use that word again, pivot uh, to the Chinese and start to build closer uh, relationships uh, with Beijing. But practically speaking, this is easier said than done. I mean, the, the, the diplomats that the UAE have, the, the level of understanding, the know-how of the entire Chinese system is severely deficient. And it's not just the UAE, it's everybody else, frankly, in the region. Uh, they just don't understand how the Chinese uh, think, operate, and heck, we don't as well. But for them, it really, there's, a, there's not just a language barrier, there's a cultural barrier. Uh, sure, a lot of it is just based on transactionalism and economic profit and interest. Fine, that's the universal language. But you still have to understand how the Chinese operate, and they don't. I mean, they obviously have a much better understanding of how we run things and what we care about and what our constraints are. But with the Chinese, it's an entirely different ball game, and they don't have the diplomats for that. They don't have the personnel for that. It's a tiny country, once again. The bandwidth is tiny. The capacity is tiny. So to really reorient yourself strategically uh, uh, and um, look towards the East, you got to have a better understanding of what the Chinese perspectives are and what the priorities are and how they operate. And right now, it's just nowhere near that. And I think, I don't think it will get to that anytime soon because the UAE still strongly believes in the relationship with the United States, despite our reduced involvement in that part of the world. Well, that brings us to the United States. Why are Washington and the UAE so tied together? I mean, if the US has Saudi Arabia, why do they need the UAE for cooperation on these operations as well? So I'm going to make a broad statement and then tie it back to the UAE. Uh, as you know, this is no secret. Uh, we've been trying to reduce our involvement in the Middle East for quite some time. Uh, this has now uh, spanned multiple administrations. This is not just the Biden administration, not just the Trump administration, but also the Obama administration. And we haven't been very good at that. And one of the reasons, I would say, beyond our incompetence and our uh, hubris and our uh, uh, idealism is the fact that we do not have a whole lot of partners in the Middle East who are able to step up to allow us to draw down. So whenever you want to draw down, at least you got to make sure that somebody else is sort of uh, uh, able to stand on their own feet and prevent security vacuums from forming and what have you. The UAE is one of those very rare exceptions. And that's why we care about it a whole lot. That's why we're excited about it, because we really consider it as the most effective uh, military partner and strategic partner that we have in that part of the world. We look at the UAE almost like the same way we look at Israel. Um, highly effective, one of the very few that can actually engage in combined arms, so integrate air and uh, ground uh, uh, operations, uh, able to project power, able to train with us in ways that are just uh, really remarkable, uh, interoperable at very high percentages and also almost across domains, minus naval, because they never invest in naval. It's not just them, it's everybody else in the region. Um, so that's why we care about them. That's why we call them Little Sparta. That's why we um, rely on them to, at least now moving forward, not just participate in coalition operations, but also to try to lead some diplomatic efforts and initiatives that would help us, uh, you know, uh, bring some calm and lower the temperature in the region. 
Uh, a lot of that now is possible, I believe, not just because of the competence of the UAE, but because uh, so many dynamics have changed in the region uh, as far as Arab-Israeli relations, uh, post-Abraham Accords. So there's a lot of opportunity for the EU to step up and play roles that used to be played traditionally by the Egyptians and the Saudis. Um, and we've enabled a lot of that. Uh, uh, the UAE just didn't just become a powerhouse on its own. We, we have... We have been major players in that evolution, uh, not just in the provision of arms, but also in just uh, treating the UAE quite differently uh, in uh, in Washington, in in, um, in the deals we make with them, in the trust that we have in them. Um, so that's why we we look at it quite differently. Where we see it as a unique uh, uh, partner in the region um, that is effective, that is well governed, that knows how to manage its resources. It gets in trouble every now and then. We weren't quite exactly super excited about its intervention in Yemen beyond the counterterrorism campaign against AQAP. But, uh, you know, no two partners agree on everything. So that's why we're excited about it. The way why, why they're excited about us is because we remain the number one option for them. What do you see in the future for the UAE? Do you think they become more powerful, less powerful? Where does the UAE go over the next 20 years or so? Right. So I think we start off with this... Um, assumption that if they can actually transform their economy, that things will be um, uh, a whole lot better for them and the future will be much more prosperous. So that's that's the key ingredient. And I think that, and I hope they realize this, they have to temper that ambition, that aggressive ambition with some realities that are just inescapable and that many other countries have had to go through, uh, which is you always have to worry about overstretch, uh, overreach, uh, I mean, great powers have done it before, so obviously it applies as well to middle and small powers. And I think they're starting to realize that that's why they're sort of gradually, quietly drawing down in those places that we talked about before in the Red Sea, uh, dismantling a few bases here and there. They're obviously out of Afghanistan now, so they've gotten everything that they wanted to get out of from there in terms of teaching, in terms of the, uh, the exercises with the Americans and all that. So. They have to balance between this aggression, aggressive ambition and power projection, but also uh, sustainability and always preserve the home front. So if they can maintain that balance, I think they're in good shape for the next at least decade or so. Because yes, the future is post hydrocarbon, but we're not there yet. And the international economy still very much heavily relies on that, not to mention natural gas. Um, So they still have a role to play and the more successful they are at diversification, the more prosperous their future will be. But that applies to every single other country in the region, frankly. Five generations is all the time that the UAE has to decide the future for the next few centuries. To take this one-time blessing of abundant oil wealth to set them up for the future. Oil won't be here forever. And it may take 80 to 100 years for us to kick the habit, but it most likely won't be our main energy source a century from now. And Abu Dhabi needs to prepare for that eventuality. So far, Abu Dhabi is doing a lot of things right. It's trying to get in early and be the main supplier and future of energies like hydrogen. They're trying to turn themselves into a mega Singapore for Middle Eastern trade. They're trying to diversify their income revenues with avenues like logistics and tourism. But they're also doing a lot of things wrong, and a lot of things that haven't gone so well. A failed blockade of Qatar, costly wars in Libya and Somalia against the rising regional power that is Turkey, supporting radical groups throughout the region, selling weapons to various countries, keeping a pressurized lid on the population's domestic freedoms. Even just the future problem of not putting many, if any, taxes on the people living there and just relying on oil revenues to pay the bills. Meaning that if the day were to come and they had to build a universal tax system, the population may not willingly go for that ride. But these are all future problems. This is Abu Dhabi's moment in the sun. What they do with that fleeting moment, though, is still yet to be seen. Thank you so much for everybody who tuned into this episode. The UAE is a country we've mentioned a bunch of times on the program, but only ever in passing. So it was good to finally dig in and do a deep dive on this one. This week, we launch our written analysis pieces that accompany the show. 
with our first piece on the Vanilla Wars of Madagascar, now available on our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. These are researched, deep dive written reports from the great team here at The Red Line on topics that so often shape the region they're in, but fly under the mainstream radar. So we are very excited to be putting out even more content on a number of great topics. And if you want to read these pieces as soon as they come out or even comment or ask questions, the best way you can do that is through our social media. You can find us on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, and Discord on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz, Oz is in Australia. This show would not be possible without the support of our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep the show going. Our Patreons get to join in on games nights, live Q&As, and get extra materials for the show. And the Patreon donations all 100% go back into the program, helping us pay for staff, programs, hosting, websites, and lawyers that are essential for running a show like this. I cannot thank our current patrons nearly enough for their support, and if you feel like you could spare a couple of dollars a week or just want to pick my brains or something geopolitical, I would greatly appreciate the support. As usual, here are the three book recommendations if you want to take your study into the UAE even further. The first is Rebuilding Arab Defense, America's Quest for Military Partnership in the Middle East by Bilal Saab, going over the US's main goals here in the region. A great overview for what's coming up in the future. The second would be Yemen in Crisis by Helen Lackner. This is without a doubt the best book available on the subject of the war in Yemen, and I absolutely loved it. And the third book is The End of the Empire in the Gulf by Tancred Branshaw for a comprehensive look at the history of the UAE. I want to give a big thanks to our guests this week, Bilal Saab, who was absolutely amazing, and Helen Lackner and Hilal Kashan, who made their second appearances here on the program. We're very happy to have them back on the show. I also want to put a major thanks out to my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zavella, research assistants and writers here at the show, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawth on our audio cleaner, Marissa Raft, our videographer, who actually just put out a great animated video on our YouTube channel on the two-front war in India, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. All of these wins the shows recently have are as much to do with you as they are to do with me. So I'm very thankful for the fantastic team I have. The very last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. There is no way we ever thought we'd get to where we are, and it is amazing to see so many of you email me each week to ask questions or just want to catch up for a chat. So I want to say thank you for all of your support of the show. We'll be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit the Redline Podcast dot com.